Previously we've shown that chipping away the fusion crust of meteorites will not lose copious amounts of helium-3 or other precious solar wind-induced isotopes. And we also saw that, contrary to what the propagandists claim, the Apollo samples do in fact show ferric iron contents that are commensurate to still water at Norther sites after being heated in a vacuum chamber for two days straight. Other samples, most notably the ones from Apollo 16, show abundant ferric iron. So much for the lack of oxidation in the Apollo samples. Next we come to Webb's objection over Bill Casing's claim that the micrometeoroid impacts, or zap bits, could be created using a multi-stage projectile gun. Casing wrote in his book that such a gun exists in Santa Barbara, although he doesn't mention the company by name. Webb then identifies the company in question, and spends several minutes explaining why that particular gun couldn't have created the zap bits because it had the wrong nozzle size. There is a laboratory in Santa Barbara that specializes in extremely high speed impact studies. They've achieved velocities of 32,000 feet per second with a two-stage projectile system. Obviously, rock specimens could be exposed to high-speed particles, thus simulating small particle meteorite bombardment. Here, Casing offers up one of his famous I know a guy who knows a guy stories. It's no more than a bare assertion fallacy. Casing says that some unidentified company in Santa Barbara had equipment back in the 60s that was capable of emulating micrometeoroid impacts and thus produced the zap bits found in NASA's fake moon rocks. So why didn't Casing give us the name of the company? Was it a secret? No. Was he protecting a source? No. He just didn't want to make it easy for anybody to check the facts. It's not impossible to figure out who the company was by looking at the clues Casing left us. Casing said this laboratory used a two-stage projectile system capable of 32,000 feet per second. Okay. He's obviously talking about a two-stage light gas gun. Two-stage describing the design, light gas describing the gas in the pump tube, usually hydrogen or helium. I'm not going to waste valuable class time describing how this gun works, but if you've ever played with a pellet gun, you already understand the concept thoroughly. The salient point here is that the projectile has to fit snugly into the barrel if they want to maintain control of it and hit their targets. Now, there were about a dozen of these guns in labs across the United States in the 60s. One was in Santa Barbara, at the General Motors Defense Research Laboratories. Long story short, they were hurling one and a quarter inch metallic discs, either aluminum or copper or tungsten, at targets, sheets of steel and other metals, and measuring the shockwave characteristics to calculate the shock Huguenot equations of state. In other words, they were probably trying to figure out if they could induce enough shock or vibration to detonate a Soviet ICBM re-entering the Earth's atmosphere by throwing a fast-moving cloud of custom-designed shrapnel at it. That's my educated guess as to what their defense contract was about. They had more things to worry about back in the 60s than manufacturing moon rocks. The limiting factor in using this gun is that the barrel was designed for one and a quarter inch projectiles weighing 100 to 200 grams. If they tried to fire microgram-sized shot with this gun, they would have difficulty controlling it. They'd have no directionality. If more than one high-velocity shot hit a silicate rock simultaneously, the multiple stress points would probably fracture the rock. In fact, if they used too much shot, they would pulverize their targets. And if they used too little shot, it would get hung up in the sabot or get lost in the barrel. <sighs> what a waste of time. Casing never said that was the actual gun used. He just mentioned it as an example of a multi-stage gun. See these words here, for example. Webb knows this full well, but likes to put words in his opponent's mouths whenever he can't disprove what they actually said. In any case, Webb confirmed that suitable guns did exist in the 60s, and all you need is one with the right nozzle size. Good because NASA certainly had plenty of money to build one. Webb then goes on to claim that this gun could not achieve the 32,000 feet per second speed that Casing referred to. But most importantly, this gun fell short of the 32,000 feet per second bogey that Casing claimed it had. 
So maybe he didn't even know about this gun after all and just made the whole thing up. That's possible. I doubt Bill, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, honesty is the best period casing, made up anything. As far as this gun, falling short of speed goes, I find it curious that Webb rarely uses a direct quote and merely highlights the text and paraphrases it without giving his viewers the chance to even read what was said. If we pause the video, we find the section he highlights reads, we could launch a 200 gram projectile to a velocity of 21,000 feet per second in an evacuated chamber to strike an instrumented target positioned a meter from the muzzle. If we reduced the projectile mass to 100 grams, we could launch at 27,000 feet per second. This indicates that as the projectile mass gets reduced by 100 grams, an additional 6,000 feet per second is gained in speed. A 200 gram projectile travels 21,000 feet per second. A 100 gram projectile travels 27,000 feet per second. Considering that micrometeoroids typically weigh less than 1 gram, a projectile that size would thusly achieve speeds of 33,000 feet per second, which is slightly faster than the 32,000 feet per second that casing referred to. Evidence that a projectile of such weight would travel at around that speed is supported by the inhibited shape charge launcher used today by the Southwest Research Institute. This light gas gun fires aluminium projectiles weighing between 0.3 and 1.5 grams to simulate micrometeoroid bombardment on the International Space Station, and these projectiles obtain speeds of 11 kilometers per second, or about 36,000 feet per second. Close enough. So once again, Webb has showed us that there indeed was a capable accelerator available at the time, and all that would be needed is a similar gun having a narrower barrel to accommodate such a small projectile. Then, from a more practical standpoint, how would anyone back in the 60s know what a micrometeoroid impact looked like? How would they know how to simulate it correctly? What data would they have used to verify that their projectiles were the right shape, size, weight, material, and traveling at the correct speed? NASA performed their first micrometeoroid impact studies in 1966 and 1967 by sending detectors to the moon on five lunar orbiter missions. The data NASA collected from that experiment was used to calculate a risk assessment and determine how much protection was necessary for the Apollo astronauts and their spacecraft. Artificial micrometeoroid impact studies were not even dreamed of until the long-term missions came around, the shuttle, Skylab, and the International Space Station. Oh, weren't they? Then how do you explain this clip from the 1983 documentary, NASA, the 25th Year? Unknowns about the moon were numerous. Such things as whether an astronaut would sink into dust over his head were a real concern. Lunar impact studies like these were carried out in an attempt to learn. Researchers fired projectiles simulating meteors hitting the moon into sand-like and rocky materials and then measured how much material was thrown out by the impact. This animation shows how scientists believe the huge crater Tycho was formed on the moon, a crater 54 miles wide. A series of picture-taking Ranger spacecraft slammed into the moon. Then, five lunar orbiters photographed over 90% of the moon's surface, including the never-before-seen backside. We saw a glimpse, too, of our own planet from lunar distance. But most important of all, it made possible the selection of landing sites. So it seems, NASA was simulating meteoroid impact with the moon long before their surveyors had even tested the bearing strength of the lunar surface or before their lunar orbiters were even sent to experience the real deal. And yet, 
Webb would have you believe that these experiments were not even dreamed of until the long duration space station days? Pull the other one. But hey, Webb did confirm that NASA sent their lunar orbiter spacecrafts in advance. And one of their goals was to establish the dangers of micrometeoroid impacts. I'd say that would have given NASA the right idea as to how they would go about faking it. Webb certainly seems to be shooting himself in the foot a lot lately. But I'll give him kudos for bringing up the Lunar Orbiter spacecrafts. Because, in addition to the micrometeoroid impact studies, these probes were specifically sent to map the lunar surface prior to the Apollo missions so that Apollo planners would know exactly what the lunar surface looked like. Webb has to be the first propagandist that I've seen who even acknowledges the lunar orbiter. Most others ignore it altogether and exploit images of Apollo surface features that were photographed by Cellini, Clementine, LRO and various other post-Apollo craft as if NASA had no way of knowing what the lunar surface looked like prior to Apollo. Now Webb did mention the inhibited shape charge launcher in his video, which brings us to his next straw man. He objects that loading aluminium pellets wouldn't work, because geologists would notice that the metal is out of place.